the premise behind this is kind of the long back in, I want to say about January, February, a nation state came into possession of uh, some zero day exploits for Microsoft Exchange. And they started out with hacking a couple of exchange servers, um, doing, you know, standard nation state thing. At some point, Microsoft got wind of this. They released a patch, an out of bounds patch. Now, typically when nation state actors know they've been caught on to, they scurry away and then they come back later with something else. This wasn't the case. Uh, essentially what multiple people reported happened is they just went full pedal to the metal. I'm guessing they thought, uh, might sort of coming out with a patch. People are going to install the patch and we're not going to be able to get in. So let's hack everything now, backdoor it. And then we can come back later. There's a big problem with this if uh, two folds is now you have uh, hundreds of thousands of systems that have been backdoored, but also the backdoor password was uh, in some cases static or in other cases, just easily to find. It was documented in a couple of AV blogs, which basically meant any hacker anywhere could log into these like tens, I think 60,000 total systems that were backdoored and absolutely anyone could log in. Um, so as well as the national security threat side, you have a threat of say criminals logging in and deploying ransomware to these random corporate networks. So in the end of the day, the FBI decided like, this is a really, really big problem. We need to do something. So they ended up removing the back door. They logged in via the back door and then had it remove itself, which, uh, is, uh, I think the first that this has ever happened, at least in this way, there was, I believe, Kim Zeta. If you're not following her, I definitely recommend following her. She, um, she said that this had previously been done with the core flood malware in that they, uh, they sync hold the malware and they sent out a command for the malware to uninstall itself. But that's slightly different to actually actively hacking into the systems via the back door in order to remove it. So, so if you, what you're describing, it sounds like they had a zero day, they had access, they realized, oh crap, the gig is up and they're like, oh, let's just, let's just spray and pray. Let's just get everything we can while the, the, the going is so good. But in doing so, they basically left all of these systems open to any other script kitty or whoever wants to, to log in because those credentials have been floating around somewhere on the internet. Yeah, pretty much. Um... I think it's somewhat unprecedented in the fact that I'm not aware of any other situation where a nation state attacker has indiscriminately hacked US systems. Like obviously US systems have been hacked before, but it's usually very targeted. So it was, it was very unprecedented in terms of both uh, the scale of the access they got and the risk posed by what they did. So typically the FBI would not have the authority to hack in and remove malware from victim systems. Uh, so what they did was actually quite interesting. There's uh, the Rule 41 of the Federal Criminal Procedure, which governs search and seizure. So that's say like, uh, let's say if they believed there was drugs in your house, they could go and apply for a warrant to break into your house. Like they can knock the front door off. They can go in, they can search the house for drugs. And then if they find any, they can confiscate them. So what they did here is they basically said, okay, uh, we want to be able to search a computer for malware. And then if we find the malware, we're going to confiscate it. So essentially, That's an interesting yeah. interpretation. So essentially, they basically, uh, they basically gave themselves the authority to uh, essentially become a malware removal service by sort of twisting this law, which typically is for search and seizure of, uh, of evidence of a crime. Wow, that's bizarre. That's that, that's fascinating. So, was the decision to do that, and and maybe we don't know the logic they use, but was was the idea their concern that this is such a big deal that they have to do something to minimize the potential damage to these, I guess, companies that have this backdoor installed, or were, were, were there other motives that they that they had? Um, well, I think the way the warrant was written, it wouldn't have allowed them to go in and search for anything else. So it was specifically limited to, hey, you can go in and remove the malware. So I don't think there was any like uh, any ulterior motive, but it was very, very interesting. Um, I'm sure this wasn't their first port of call. They weren't like, hey, let's just hack them. 
I'm sure like uh, as a lot of people on Twitter brought, brought up, you could have done victim notification. But uh, the problem with victim notification is there is, as of today, currently no framework to do it at scale. So if they were, if they wanted to notify all of these US victims, uh, I believe it was just US victims they were allowed to hack into and remove. So even just the US victims, I think that was something like 40,000. So in order to notify them, they would have to, they have the IP address. First, they have to get a warrant for whatever subscriber controls the IP address. So that's your AT&T or Spectrum or Comcast, whatever. And then they have to request the subscriber information. So that's who pays the bill. So you have to do that for 40,000 different IP addresses across like maybe 100 different ISPs. And that requires uh, them to go to court and get a warrant for that specific IP at that ISP. And then once they have that information, that's just a subscriber. That's whoever pays the internet bill. And that's not necessarily the person who runs the server. So then they're going to have to call up that person, try to get into contact with the right person, the company to talk to. And just imagine that on a scale of 40,000 people. <laughs> imagine uh, the FBI calling the help desk for some company. Like, hey, this is the FBI. <laughs> uh, here's the situation. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's just not like that's a very common scam that is used uh, or anything. But um, well, what's fascinating to me is that they that they did this, and it sounds like there's precedent that they've done it before. But this is a complete 180 of what I've always learned about engagement with law enforcement in in situations like this, where if you do have a breach or an incident, um, you have to be mindful that the purpose of law enforcement is not necessarily there to help get your business back up and running. They're there to collect evidence to prosecute someone. It sounds like their motive or at least objective is, is, is goes against that and it actually really is about helping organizations stay afloat and, and return back to business. I think so. Like I, I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall of uh, wherever this decision was made, uh, what led to the decision. But uh, as a lot of people have said on Twitter, uh, they could have done victim notification. Like no, realistically, not only would they not have had the resources to do it at that scale, but the time it would take to notify the victim and get the malware cleaned up, by then you would have had like 50 different nation state and ransomware actors inside the network. So um, I'm actually, I'm on board with them doing this. Like, I think it was, uh, it was a good call. Uh, though personally, I would prefer if someone else were to do it. Like typically, as you said, the FBI's job is their you know, criminal investigations, law enforcement, um, I think like there could be a potential conflict of interest if you have an agency whose uh, position is to investigate crimes doing something that is not investigating crimes. I think there should be a third party agency that is not law enforcement nor intelligence whose job it is to, whenever needed, like in extreme cases like this, they can log into systems and remove malware. And then was there, I, I wonder if there's a, there was a criteria on which organizations they would help versus ones they would not. Because uh, unless they're, they're saying they went out and touched all of the organizations that they're aware of that have this to help remove those back doors. I wonder if there was a priority list of who they would help and who they wouldn't, because that creates problems too. Because I can see someone complaining, well, why did you help my company? Why did you help my competitor <laughs> over here? Well, from the article I read, it sounds like it was just any US victim they could identify and they just went down an automated list and disinfected them one by one, which I think is fair. Like you can't be like, hey, we're going to, this is a big company, so we're going to protect them. But little mom and pop shop, no, they're just going to have to deal with it themselves. Yeah, I thought maybe they would have gone down the criteria of critical infrastructure, because uh, that is something, a criteria that they could argue is defensible on why they help them and not the mom and pop shop. But, but if they went down, if they went through the trouble of doing everyone that they identified, kudos to them for being able to do that. Yeah, it sounds like they did. And um, I think this should be a worst case scenario thing. I think we do need to focus on setting up some kind of at scale victim notification platform. Like you need a way to when the next WannaCry or NotPetya or Hafnium happens, there needs to be a way for the government to just phone up all those affected and be like, hey, here's what you need to do. Whereas right now, as it go, 
as it stands, they just have to go down a list of ISPs, call in a bunch of subscriber info warrants, which take weeks to get, and then contact the companies one by one. Yeah, and I think they, they've tried to do that with critical infrastructure in, in the States. There, there is an organization that is a collaboration between critical infrastructure plus uh, the FBI, where they do share things sometimes ahead of time to this group to look for indicators of compromise or other things to be looking for ahead of any public, um, any public announcement. So I think it's to this concept, similar to this concept, but broadening it to all organizations. That's why I was thinking that they could use the criteria of critical infrastructure instead of covering everyone, because they at least have that list somewhat yeah. built out over the years. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I think I'd like to see uh, the CISA agency extended maybe to to provide some kind of centralized notification platform or even be given the authority to do this themselves because uh, CISA itself is independent. They are not a law enforcement agency, they're not an intelligence agency. I don't know that they would want the authority to do this, but it would be nice to have a third party do it who didn't potentially have ulterior motives. Now, what about if organizations how could organizations opt out? Because I, I get that the idea of this, uh, some third party coming to help everyone's great, but maybe not everyone wants to help for whatever reason might be. I mean, how would companies be able to opt out? That's what I wonder how they would manage that. My position here is that there shouldn't be an opt out because not only does this directly affect the victims themselves, but it affects other people. The, these breaches are giving access to uh, customer data, uh, trade secrets for other organizations through this one organization's negligence. So I personally think there shouldn't be an opt out because the people who policies should be targeted at are the ones who would opt out. And I, I feel like that could be a very dangerous slope to go down because then you get into the argument, what happens if these the intention of these actions are good, but what if there's a screw up, they mess up and they actually or cause a problem or cause a bigger problem, then who's liable? The company never invited them in. So therefore, should this agency be liable if there are any damages? I, I think it's a really tricky uh, and slippery slope that you can go down if there's a blanket kind of mandate or statement or policy that the government essentially can go into any organization to, what, to, to do what they think is right and what the broad society thinks is right. But what if it doesn't go well? I think it's all good fun and games until something bad happens. And then there'll be a discussion. Should they have this power? Should they have this ability and, and right to do this? More the reason to give the authority to a third party agency, because then you can legislate it and say, uh, if some damage is caused, then yes, the government is liable. We will pay for those damages. But the problem with uh, when it's underneath the uh, under the rule 41 of search and seizure, then there is most likely no liability because mm -hmm. uh, like everyone's had the stories of the the police or the FBI. Yeah, they're, wrong, they're raiding the wrong house or yeah, something. Yeah, they raided the wrong house. They blew the door off and the homeowner's like, hey, what about my door? And they're like, do we look like a door repair shop to you? We don't want that for breaches. Like we don't want them to hack into someone's system. Something goes wrong. It causes uh, a loss to the organization, and then there's no ability for them to uh, to sue or to hold anyone liable because it's done under a framework which was not designed for this. I think we need a new framework specifically for this thing that states the liabilities, states like what you're entitled to if something goes wrong, and potentially gives the authority to an agency like CISA. I'm... I get the objective that something like this would try to accomplish, but I, I, I can see how there's not, there would not be broad support going back to the point around this is someone coming into your company to do something, whether it's good, the right thing, whatever. Companies should have the right to say, I don't want you in my shop. Um, so I, I think there is definitely going to be a discussion about the, definitely the liability component. And then the discussion of should any agency, third party or whoever, be able to do this? I think that's going to be the discussion. I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer because there's pros and cons on both sides. 
we'll just have to see where society chooses to land on on this topic. I, I just feel like there's just too many landmines for both sides to step on around on the topic. Yeah, I agree. I think ultimately we need to look more into frameworks to bolster security itself. Uh, rather than what do we do when everything goes wrong but then also on the other hand we do need to have a framework for what do we do when everything goes wrong because yeah, i'm sure I, I th- yeah i agree on that one like i'm sure before the fbi settled with hacking into these systems and removing the malware there was probably some big debate on like what do we do like some nation state has just backdoored all of our exchange servers <laughs> oh, what do we do about this I mean, it, that, that also highlights just the scarier <clears throat> thought that, I mean, I get a zero day is going to be very difficult to protect against, but the fact that a zero day was used, then backdoor shells were put in place and, and all of these organizations like have no idea that this have happened or have, and have no way of figuring out that it has happened. That, I think that's the scarier part as well. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed our our uninformed summary on some of this week's news. Um, We're thinking about doing a couple more videos, like maybe a video each week where we just discuss like a random in the news topic. So let us know if you'd like to see more or what you'd like to see.